G'day home brewers, thanks for tuning in. My name's Jeff and this is 15 Minutes in the Brewery. Today I'm gonna to talk about a couple of things. First of all, let's get out of the way the fact that it's 2023 and this is my first video. It's six weeks in, it's February 15th and I haven't made a video yet this year and it's probably been about two and a half months since I've made a video. So it's been a bit of a spell for me, a bit of a break and um, I don't know, I just don't, didn't really feel compelled to make videos over Christmas and New Year's, we're quite busy. Uh, and in Australia, as opposed to the Northern Hemisphere, that's our summer holidays. So the kids are off from school between uh, roughly the 17, 18, 19th of December, all the way through to the 1st of February. So our kids are off school that whole, whole entire time. So for us, it's our summer holidays. So I didn't really feel compelled to come and make videos. I really didn't brew much beer, to be honest. I brewed, I brewed one batch in early January and I didn't brew another batch again until the start of February. So I uh, haven't really been brewing much lately. Um, doesn't mean I have slowed down my desire to brew. My desire to brew is still there. Um, and at the moment, I've got a whole bunch of plans for what I want to brew going forward. I'm getting back into it again. Uh, the other reason why, so holiday, school holidays, that's one thing. And, and obviously we went on holidays as a family as well. We went away for a bit. Um, and the other reason why I haven't been brewing much well, and or making videos is because this shed, I've probably said this before in other videos, but if I haven't, this shed um, gets very hot in summer because it's only a small shed. It's a very small shed and this is Australia. I live in the outer suburbs of Sydney, so it gets bloody hot in summer. Um, the other day we had, it was 38.1 the other day, Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. That's nearly 100 Fahrenheit, I think. So. Um, pretty hot. It was humid though. It was 38 and the humidity was quite high. The dew points that day were around um, 16 at the 38 mark, but when it dropped down to 33, 34, the dew points shot back up to about 19 or 20, so it was fairly humid. Not as humid as it can get here. It can get much more humid than that when tropical air really invades us, but, uh, but it gets hot in this shed. That's what I'm trying to say. The whole point is I've got two fridges right next to me here. This shed gets extremely hot, um, sometimes upwards of 38 to 40 degrees plus in this shed. And with the fridges going, when, the, when it's that hot, I try not to get the fridges going too much. For instance, um, the hot days we had the other day, I had a fermentation going and I made sure I got the fermentation going and pretty much done. So I didn't need to cycle the fridge too much before the hot days hit. And when the hot days hit, the, the, uh, the, the beer was done and it was just conditioning and it just basically sat static at about 21 degrees Celsius. I think it cycled the fridge on probably two or three times that entire day. Um, so not much at all really. So that kept the heat down in the shed. The serving fridge obviously has to be on all the time. So that's the only one that kind of really heats the, uh, the shed up a lot. Um, and what is it at the moment? We're looking at, uh, it's only 26 in here at the moment. So that's why I'm filming a video because it's actually not that hot. It's only 26 degrees in the shed, which is not too bad. Anyway, just waffling. So. Uh, so that's why I really haven't been online much, haven't been, I actually haven't even been posting on Instagram much either, to be honest, and I haven't posted any videos because just been, don't want to come in a hot shed, haven't been brewing much, been on holidays, etc. But, back into it, um, mid-February, and I'm starting to really plan ahead as to what I'm going to be brewing in the next few months, especially as it starts to get cooler here, and I'm thinking about the kind of beers I want to be drinking coming autumn. Um, I think St. Patrick's Day is around soon. I don't know. I haven't brewed a beer for St. Patrick's Day. To be honest, I don't really care. I'll buy something. I'd rather go and buy a Guinness or buy some Kilkenny or something than brew my own, to be honest, because, you know, you can buy a beer and you have it just for one day. Um, I'm not really feeling like brewing a red ale or a stout at the moment because it's summer here, still it's hot. So St. Patrick's Day for me will be blonde ale and a bit of golden ale and some leftover Pilsner from last year, which is still going really well. Uh, Hellas, it's actually Hellas, sorry, not Pilsner. Uh, I've still got Hellas from last year. I, I think I did a video on that, and I actually talked about that beer ages ago, like last year, like a good two to three months ago. It's It's been in keg a long time. I stopped drinking it for the longest time, and I just thought I'm just gonna have a little bit every now and then, just let it condition, and I'll drink other things. And it's in a, I've transferred it to a, uh, a nine and a half liter keg just to so I could save space in the fridge and use the bigger kegs for my newer batches coming up to Christmas time. 
it's doing well. So what I want to talk about today is two things. First brief thing I want to talk about is my new taps. I've got some new taps in my fridge. Um, I don't, if you've watched this channel before, you would have seen my old taps. If you haven't, what I used to use was just beer line, 2.4 meters of beer line. And I would use picnic taps on the end and I'll keep them inside the fridge. The reason why I do that is because my shed gets so hot and it would just foam up. The taps on the outside, I just can't keep them cool enough. Um, and they would foam up because it's 26 now and that's, and it's cool now. It was 34 degrees in here earlier. Um, it's cooled down now, so that would just you just can't pour beer with taps that are that warm um, And you, I'd always be wasting beer pouring foam. So I keep everything inside the fridge um, And I was using picking taps with 2.4 roughly meters of um, I think 4 mil ID beer line and It's a pain in the neck because you have beer line hanging in there on all your different kegs and your picnic taps work both ways So if you push them down they open but if you pull them up they open So if you go to pull a tap like a pull the hose and the tap gets caught and lifts beer goes everywhere and I've done that a few times it's frustrating so I bought the um, the taps the 2.1 taps from homebrewer lab and I can't remember the name of them so I'll put the name up in this video so you can see the actual name of the taps I can't remember what they're called what are they called like party tap 2.1 I know their floating device is called a floated um, tap it party it I don't know I don't know I'll put it up Anyway, so I bought some new taps. Uh, no more beer line, just these little ingenious little taps that allow me to pour beer with no line in the fridge now. They take care, I've got the, currently the um, pressure is set to 15 PSI, just to push them to a limit to see how well they go. And this thing pours beautifully. So I'll show a pour, I'll show you the Blondale, and then we'll talk about the main subject, which is how to brew good homebrew. And my, my first and most important tip, I think, for how to master home brewing, how to brew good beer. All right, so let's get into it. I'll pour and we'll go. As you can see, I get a little bit of head, um, not a huge amount. Probably could, um, you can adjust them. He gives you instructions on how to adjust them. I probably could adjust this actually a little bit more. I'll cut it down a tiny bit. But you can actually spruce up the head on top of your beer. This glass, by the way, is actually being used two or three times, so it's not the cleanest glass. If you do that, you get a little bit of a spritz and you can uh, build a little bit of head on it. There we go. And when it's a clean glass, that head does stick around. This glass has been used uh, three times already today, so and I've just washed it, just rinsed it, so that's not going to hold a head. Alrighty, so that's my current um, main beer on tap. I've only got two on tap at the moment. I'm running out of beer. I've got another one for a minute. I'm going to actually do a transfer after this video and get that golden ale into a keg. Um, but going back to this beer, this is a blonde ale. Um, it's a nice. It's, it's a golden color. It's a lighter golden color and it's got a fair chunk of wheat in it to get that kind of that whitiness that I, It's something about wheat even in a clear beer wheat gives it a kind of a lighter yellow. It's, it's like it muddies the yellow a little bit um, But that's my Blondale. It's got wheat Munich. Sorry. I'll start at the base mod Pilsner wheat in equal amounts I'm pretty sure and then Munich and Vienna in equal amounts and then a little bit of dextrin malt. It's an American Blonde Ale. Um, it is around, it is at, it's at the maximum IBUs for a Blonde Ale. I'm pretty sure it's around 30, for the style that is. Um, the hops were Chinook, Crystal, and Comet. So, not many people use Chinook very much these days. Um, Chinook's typically like a pale ale one, like, the, like a, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, I think Chinook and Cascade. So Chinook's typical, are kind of like American Pale Ale hop. But I've used Comet and Crystal. It's the first time using Comet. I've used Crystal quite a few times before. I've used Crystal in Kolsch. Came out really nice. I've used Crystal in a Pale Ale. And that came out very nice as well. So I, I really enjoy Crystal. I think it's a really nice hop. I, there's a commercial beer that's brewed in a, a small pub and a small brewery in Victoria, Australia, that uh, makes a Kolsch 
using just crystal and it is a really nice beer. It's, an, it's not a proper Kolsch. Obviously it's not a German Kolsch if they're putting American sea hops in it, but you know what I'm saying. So it's a lovely beer. Um, it's got a soft water profile and it was fermented with British Ale 5. Um, this ferment was second gen, so second generation. It's not hazy. Hasn't come through with any haze. There was a bit of haze initially, but that haze has quickly dropped out and we've got a kind of a semi, kind of, you can see the haze. You can see kind of it's, um, it's got that bit of a haze thing going on. You can just see it. It's not chill haze. At least I don't think it's chill haze, but anyway, it's got a little bit of that haze thing going on. It's not crystal clear. Um, and I kind of like that. I think that's, I think that's okay. Cause it helps the kind of the, it, it makes me think Blondale. Anyway, if it was crystal clear and it was that color, I'd be thinking golden nail. Um, but golden nail is a little hoppier. I've got a golden nail in there now, which has got a, um, a lot more hops in it. So it's a, it's, it's a lot more bitter. Um, and that's also fermented with British Ale 5. So a golden nail with British Ale 5. Um, and that'll probably come out fairly clear as well, but not as clear as some of my other golden nails, which I did with USO 5, which are crystal clear. So a nice beer. This is a very nice beer. Uh, the combination of Comet, Crystal and Chinook is just excellent. I love it. Really love it. You don't hear people talking about those hops these days in beers. It has a really interesting fruit profile, but it's not over the top. I went, I tried to brew this as close to style as I could. That it's It's got a really nice malt backbone with a nice balance of hops. It's not hoppy like a pale ale. It's not hoppy like a, uh, like an IPA. Definitely not like hop, definitely not like an IPA. But even like a, like a most modern, I think most modern pale ales and Australian kind of hazy pale ales and Pacific ales and stuff, or New Zealand Pilsners. It's not as hoppy as that, no way, nowhere near it. Um, but it's got enough fruitiness that it stands next to the malt, but you can, you can get the malt big time. You can get the hops and you get the uniqueness of the hops. And I actually think they really pair, the, the hopper Roman flavor really pairs well with the, um, the Vienna and the Munich malt that I've used. So no crystal. I think crystal is probably wrong for this style. Uh, I'd put crystal, well not crystal, but I put, well it's kind of crystal I guess. I put um, uh, golden, like um, in my golden ales I use um, caramel or caragold. Um, I've been using that, which is a crisp malt. Um, in the pale hours, I don't necessarily use crystal anymore, but I can, I do use it sometimes. I've, still, I've got some left that I need to use. Probably going to go into some bitters. Um, but kept the crystal out and just, just the seven, I think the seven and a half Lover Bond Gladfield Munich and the four and a half Lover Bond Gladfield Vienna in combo with the Pilsner Malt. The Pilsner Malt was a Viamid, which is, I use that because it's all I've got. Not for any special reason. I actually don't have any pale malt at the moment in my brewery. I've got no pale malt. The only base malt I've got, apart from a little bit of wheat, is Vyman Pilsner malt. So that's the reason why I use the Vyman. Um, and yeah, so really nice beer. It's, it's got a nice, it's kind of more subtle. It's on the subtle fruitiness. It's not in your face fruity at all, um, but I'm actually really enjoying it. And I, I did a soft water profile with equal parts, pretty much chloride, sulfate, um, calcium, nearly equal parts of all three to be honest. Um, and even a little bit of table salt, a little bit of sodium chloride went in this just to help soften it and um, to bring out those flavors. Um, a little bit of seasoning as they say, as chefs would say anyway. So yeah, let's talk about, forget the beer for a second, let's talk about homebrew. So the main thing I wanted to talk about tonight was um, how to make better homebrew, how to improve your homebrewing and how to homebrew better. Now, I'm not the world's foremost expert in homebrewing. I'm just not. And I don't think anyone on YouTube is. There's a few that could be debatably maybe close to it. Um, I've only been brewing since 2009, since July 2019, sorry, not 2009, I haven't been brewing that long. So 2019, so 2021, 20, 22, 24. So I'm coming up to four years of homebrewing and I've brewed a lot of crappy beers in that time. And I've brewed some absolutely sensational beers. And the, the thing I want to talk about tonight, 
because there's many things you can do to improve your home brewing. There's a lot of different things you can do. But the one thing I want to talk about tonight, how to really improve your homebrew, is consistency. And brewing recipes until you master them. Now, I don't think this gets talked about enough um, in homebrewing circles online. Um, not to say people don't talk about it, obviously some people do. But what I did when I first started homebrewing is I brew every recipe under the sun. Well, that's what I wanted to do. I had a plethora of beers in my head that I wanted to get out and, you know, I've got to brew this, I've got to brew that, I've got to brew some blonde ales, Belgian blondes, I want to brew American blondes, I want to brew pale ales and IPAs. I want to brew a stout, a porter, a brown ale, an amber ale. You know, I want to brew some English bitters and German lagers and Czech pilsners and oh, I want to brew it all, right? And so you do. So you go from brew to brew to brew to brew. One minute you're brewing a Kolsch, the next minute you're brewing a Pilsner, the next minute you're brewing an IPA, the next minute you're brewing a Pale Ale, and then you're trying to brew a Blonde Ale. It's just going around all these, it's just, you're just going this all over the place. Touching every base randomly. Um, and what I found for me personally was by doing it that way, I was never able to quickly and consistently improve my brewing techniques. Because by changing the recipe all the time, changing the volume, the recipe, and all that, um, I was effectively brewing a completely different beer, uh, which required, and, and, and a lot of different beer styles require different brewing techniques or different brewing methods in order to kind of brew them well. Now there are certain things that you've got to do well all the time, like sanitation, right? Don't get me wrong, there's, there's definitely those like, there's, there's certain things which are like non-negotiable. Sanitation, you've got to do it well. Um, dial in your brewing system really quickly, as quick as you can. Get used to the boiler freight, you know, get all that stuff written down and get it into your recipe program so you can, you can, uh, you know your boiler freights, you know your evaporation, you know, you know your hop utilization, you know the, um, the, the dead space and all that stuff, right? And I never had a problem with that. The problem I kept having was I'd brew a pale ale and I'd really, I, oh, I didn't like it, there was something wrong with it. The recipe wasn't quite right. And then I just think to myself, oh, I don't want to keep brewing that. I'll just brew something else. I'll brew, I'll brew a gold nail because I want to brew a gold nail. I'll brew a gold nail. Ah, that came out okay. It wasn't that great. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that great. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I want to brew a stout as well. So I'll brew a Schwartz beer, right? Because I'm no, it's kind of weather's not, yeah, I'll brew a Schwartz beer. Brew a Schwartz beer. Oh, brew a Dunkel. Brew a Dunkel. That was average, a little bit below average. Oh, it's getting hot now. I've got to brew a lager, so I'll brew a lager. Oh, I wouldn't mind brewing some fruity beer because I've been drinking a lot of Schwartz beer and subpar Dunkel, so I start brewing some pale ale. You know what I mean? And you're just going around and around in circles. You're brewing, going from one beer to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And I know there's a guy on YouTube, he did the whole 100 brews thing, 99 brews thing, whatever it is. I've watched pretty much all these episodes. They're quite good. Um, and yeah, you can do that if you want. You can literally brew a different beer every single time if you want. But what I found for myself is my brewing, just my overall brewing and beer quality really started to improve when I just dialed back the excitement for brewing 100 different beers and just decided I'm gonna start perfecting a certain number of beers. I want house beers. I wanna have a handful of beers so that I can just pull a recipe out and go, you know what? I'm gonna have that house beer or that one. I'm gonna brew that one today. I wanna to put that one back on tap. And having those beers with recipes which which you tweak a little bit but don't hugely change which vo you know the volumes and the and the ingredients they don't change a great deal maybe tweak here and there what you find is you start to pick up on little mistakes you're making because you're no longer changing huge things every time you brew you're not entirely changing the grain bill so if you're keeping a similar grain bill all of a sudden yeah you start to pick up the difference in hops and I know that's funny, right? Because I've, I've brewed with so many different hops, but I've hardly brewed the same beer with a lot of different hops. It's my whole brew pale ale with like Citra, Mosaic, and Galaxy. And then the next thing I brew a, uh, a golden ale with, you know, Crystal and bloody um, Idaho 7. And then I'll brew a pale ale with um, El Dorado and Centennial. And then I'll brew Amarillo. And it's. It's hard, because hops are affected by the whole beer experience. Like the, the flavor, uh, the malt backbone, and the, the, the malts you put in, they really do affect the flavor of your hops. And also, different top beer styles require different you know, regimes for 
fermentation, different yeasts, and that yeast character is going to change. There's another big one, right? So the yeast character is going to change from beer to beer. And I guess I found I just wasn't really grasping the subtle differences, I guess, the nuances. So, well, probably halfway through last year, I decided, no, I'm going to start really nailing some styles. I want to have a handful of styles, probably half a dozen styles, that I can just go back and forwards on tap. And then in between those, I can brew some different stuff. So I thought, I've got to get a lager, nice Hellas. I wouldn't mind a Pilsner and a Hellas. I wouldn't mind like a darker beer, and I'd love dark lager, so like a Schwartz beer. I love big IPAs, but I love red ones, so if like a red rye IPA, I want to do that. Uh, a blonde ale, I want to nail a blonde ale, which I'm currently in the process of doing. Golden ales, that golden ale over there is my fourth iteration. We have a very, very, almost identical recipe, just changing hops here and there. Um, so golden ale, blonde ale, pale ale, IPA, a Schwartz beer. I'm probably gonna brew a porter slash stout and, um, and a couple of lagers. And so now I'm in the process of brewing these recipes, but just changing out hops, maybe changing out the temperature, adjusting temperature, adjusting the little things in the brewing process to see how it changes the beer. Maybe adjust, same grain bill, same hops. Maybe I'll adjust the water this time. Change the water softness, maybe make it a little bit stiffer. Maybe put some more calcium sulfate in, see how the hops go. See if they pop more, as they say. It's just those little things. And I think in the last six months for me, this is for me, right? I'm not saying this is gonna work for everyone. This is just my um, biased advice, if you wanna take it. Um, for me in the last six months, I feel like I've really started to um, grasp a lot of the finer nuances as I've just repeated styles. So, um, so, my, so like for example, like I said, my golden ale, that particular recipe is pretty basic recipe. That recipe is staying pretty static now and I'm just uh, swapping hops out um, and changing the water profile, just adjusting the water profile around to see if more gypsum really would help. Because it's a bit of beer, a golden ale is traditionally like a more, like 35 to 40 IBUs or more little bit more um, so just playing around with gypsum in that one to see how it works this um, blonde ale is a softer beer it's got the wheat in it it should be a softer a little bit lighter beer so for this one I'm experimenting now with um, a really soft water profile and British R5 which is just a much softer a nice fruity softer uh, yeast which brings out malt whereas USO5 tends to kind of not bring out the malt flavors if you know what I mean and that's the kind of things you pick up when you're repeating recipes and you're just changing out things like yeast, or maybe just adjusting your water, or maybe just swapping out hops and you start to see how different hops hold up against that grain bill. So yeah, that's that's all I pretty much wanted to talk about. Um, I think that's uh, good advice, because you know we're all like it. I mean, every time, every, every one of us is the same. I'm guilty as anyone. When you first start homebrewing, you want to brew everything, you know? And I wanted to brew every style, so. And I'm gonna brew every style eventually, one day. I mean, I've got plans to brew I want to brew a mild, dark mild. Um, I want to brew uh, a really big um, stout. I want to brew a dark mild. I want to brew... What else do I want to brew? Um, I've got plans. I've got about five different beers. I want to brew a uh, Belgian blonde. Kind of like the Elisjuf kind of way. I want to brew that. Um, and a Belgian uh, double or triple. Um... You know, and there's, there's a few interesting different beer styles that I want to brew. Um, but I also want to have a backbone in my fridge. I want to have consegs of ke sorry, kegs. <laughs> I want to have kegs of consistently good beer with recipes that I'm really tweaking and working hard on. That I know I can just go to my fridge and just, you know what, I'm just going to grab a Blondale. Oh, it's a nice beer. It really is. It's a really good beer, that one. Probably slightly too carbonated at the moment. I'm getting a fair bit of um, carbon and acid on that, but probably should dial the carbonation down a little bit, but I'm testing a tap. I wanted to see how it went at 15 PSI, so I'm actually gonna probably um, dial that down and um, just burp, burp the keg a bit and try and get that back down to about 11 or 12 PSI. Um, but that's a beautiful beer, malty, but a little bit fruity. And Comet, well, Comet. What an interesting hop Comet is. Comet and Crystal and Chinook in combo. What an interesting combination. Fruity, but it's a kind of fruitiness that you don't get in a lot of beers these days because a lot of brewers are brewing with 
New World hops, big Australian, New Zealand hops, big American, Idaho Seven and Mosaic and those kind of hops. Um, these old guys that come back from the, what, I think the 70s and 80s, um, or even earlier maybe, I don't know. Um, these are quite old hops, so the fact that they had hops this tasty back then is, is very surprising. But they're very interesting hops. I encourage you to get into them. Comet, Crystal and Chinook, excellent combo. Different, fruity, but a kind of different kind of fruitiness and not something you've, you're gonna find in a brew pub or a small craft brewery pretty much these days. But anyway, I've gone on for too long, as I always do. It's probably about 25 minutes in the brewery today. So if you've held through to the end of my, um, my monologuing, then uh, you deserve an award. Thank you for watching. I uh, hope I've inspired you guys to do that, and girls, all you brewers out there to do that. Um, thanks for watching again. Hopefully I'll see you soon, not too long, hopefully in the next video. Otherwise, cheers, happy brewing. See you soon, bye.